We are four weeks into our sermon series looking through the letter of 1 Corinthians. And uh, so far it's been very encouraging, very challenging. Um, Lots of fixing our eyes on our King Jesus and remembering our allegiance to him, remembering what he's done for us, what his life and his death have accomplished for us. Um, We're into chapter two today. Like I've been saying for the last couple of weeks, we're going to be spending the better part of a year uh, looking at this one letter, we'll have breaks you know, along the way. Last week we looked at the last part of chapter 1 and uh, this week, in fact let me, let me just read for you this first part, as you'd, as you'd understand with a letter, even though Paul was, as we looked at in the first week, answering a, a bunch of questions that Chloe and her people had asked Paul. And so really this is a response to things that were going on there and questions that the Christians had in the city of Corinth. Uh, but if you've ever written a letter or read a letter, uh, you'll know that you know, we don't normally write our own chapters. For example, those were put in later so we could quickly reference Paul's letters. Uh, but it was, it was really a continuous <clears throat> uh, letter um, intended, I think, mostly to be read out in one go, or at least in big chunks. And so even, even though we're breaking it down into really small chunks, these are always within the context of the big chunks. And so last week will flow into this week, will flow into next week, and it's very difficult, actually, just to pick out a little bit and, and treat it in an abstract kind of way without looking at not only what is Paul trying to say in, that, in an overarching kind of way, but like we've looked at continually or, or consistently is what is the context of this city in Corinth in about 50-ish AD? What does it look like 20 years or so after Jesus died and rose and ascended to the Father? What, is it, what does it look like in that era? And so we'll be bringing those things out today as well. So let me read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. I think today is going to be very encouraging for us. If, you have, if you've ever uh, hesitated to share your faith, if you've ever thought I am incompetent or I, am, I can't speak well enough, I don't know enough, I haven't been a Christian long enough. If you've ever thought any of those kinds of things, or if you've been fearful about sharing about the love of Jesus and the lordship of Jesus, my hope is today will be incredibly encouraging to us. This is how Paul starts his, well, his second chapter. Again, we chopped it up. <clears throat> this is how he starts his thought. It says, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, so again, he has visited them, he lived with them, he loved them. They worked together for the gospel, and then he's gone off to start new missional endeavors in other places. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, announcing the mystery, or maybe your version says the testimony of God to you, did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not be based on human wisdom, but on God's power. Let's pray, see what God would have for us today. So Father, again, we need your help today. As we think about your scriptures and kind of rest in your scriptures here, please help us. Help us to be attentive to your Holy Spirit as you minister to our hearts and our minds that we would not just be hearers of your word, but doers also. That we become more like Jesus. We would understand more of your character, more of who you are and what you've done in the world, more of what you'd have us do in the world and how you're working in us and, and want to work through us. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. So when Paul writes to the Corinthians... He says, this is what I didn't do among you. He starts off there. Here's what I didn't come with. I didn't come with brilliance of speech. It was pretty well known that Paul wasn't the great orator. Uh, When Apollos comes along, he was known as perhaps a super apostle, a really, really excellent preacher. That's why Paul, just a couple of uh, verses earlier, is saying, we must not divide over this guy's a great preacher, so I'm behind him. Or this guy's a great writer, so I'm behind him. Well, this guy was one of the 12 and even one of the three, so I'm behind Peter. He says, we can't have those kind of divisions in church. 
It says that when I came to you, I didn't come like Apollos, a great preacher. I didn't come with brilliance of speech. I didn't come with wisdom. I didn't come with eloquent speech or preaching with persuasive words. It says I didn't come with those things. It says I didn't even come with a general kind of knowledge. And again, like he's done throughout the first chapter, he's contrasting his ministry with the sophists of the day. Remember those influences, those first century Corinthian influences, uh, you know, with their uh, pithy 30 second grabs and YouTube videos and TikTok millions of followers and those kinds of things, who had brilliance of speech, who were known for their eloquence, who were known for their worldly wisdom, who were known for their secret knowledge. I have the secret knowledge. Come and follow me. Become one of my disciples and I will tell you the secret knowledge. I'll tell you the secrets of life. All of your problems will be dealt with if you just follow my five steps to keto mastery or whatever it is. <clears throat> Paul's again contrasting his ministry with the dominant culture of the day, saying everyone else is trying to win people like this. And he's saying that is not how the kingdom of God works. We don't work like that. Not only do we not work like that, that doesn't work. I did not come with brilliance of speech, wisdom, preaching with persuasive words, or secret kind of knowledge. He says, rather, I decided to know nothing among you, except for one thing. There's I'm a, I'm a one issue preacher, is what he says. I'm flying one single flag. He says, Jesus Christ and him crucified. So Paul begins by highlighting this deliberate rejection of building a ministry or a life upon human wisdom and eloquence in speech. Again, unlike the philosophers and orators and sophists of the day who relied on persuasive rhetoric, relied on intellectual prowess, Paul chose to focus exclusively on this one thing, and that is the message of Jesus and his crucifixion. So if Paul didn't come with brilliance and uh, elegance and sophistication and wisdom and secret knowledge. What did he come with? He tells, he says. He says, I came with weakness. So while the sophists, the politicians, the leaders, the military of the day were projecting might and power and prestige and position, Paul says, well, I came in, in weakness. And he goes, and I, he said, I came in fear. He says, I came in trembling. He says, I came announcing the mystery or the testimony of God. He says, this is what I came doing. Not like this, like this. This is not how the kingdom of God works, and that doesn't work in the kingdom of God. Not with eloquent speech and preaching, he says, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. So we're pretty used to hearing words like Jesus Christ and him crucified in our day. Those two words really go together. Uh, I did a bunch of word searches and uh, AI searches and just on what is the crucifixion, what is the crucifixion? And they'd always start with like the Roman historical context of his crucifixion, but it's inextricably tied to Jesus, <clears throat> the most notable person to ever be crucified. And these Christians have built up this entire religion and practice of faith built upon their Messiah who was crucified. And so for us, we're like, yeah, Jesus and crucifixion, that, that goes together. We understand that. that. That makes sense. But in the day, in the day dominated by Rome, when people are still being crucified, putting together Messiah or anointed one or Christ with crucified was a shocker, actually. I want to look at this a little bit so we can understand. We're missing how, we might miss how significant it is that Paul intentionally and eagerly uses these particular words and says, I knew nothing else but this. These things together, nothing else. Here's where this makes no sense. 
Uh, the Christ was, from the Greek word Christos, means the anointed one, the one who was to come, the Messiah, the, the, the person we're waiting for, where some look back even all the way back to Genesis 3 and say that God is promising this Messiah even from right back in the garden as they're being booted. That the, the one is to come. He's going to make everything right. He's going to undo everything wrong. This is the anointed one. This is the Messiah. He's going to save us. He's going to free us. And so in particular, the, the chosen people of God in the day, this, the Jews were looking forward to, they had been subjected by this nation and subjected by that nation and taken over by this nation and exiled by that nation and subjected by another nation and now finally here's Rome. They're still subjects, not, not ultimately or not directly to their king, but through another Lord. And they're waiting for this chosen one, the saviour to come and free them. In the New Testament, Christ is used more like a title rather than a name. So you might ask the average Australian on the street, if I say Jesus Christ, what does that mean? And they might think Jesus first name, Christ last name. Or they might not even really know what does it mean. No category for it. But for us, we, it's not, I mean, it is a shorthand. Jesus the Christ is probably a more appropriate way of talking about him. Jesus telling us who the person is, and then the Christ telling us his position, his title, his job, description. What has he done? Prophesied in the Old Testament, fulfilled in the New Testament. This concept is throughout Scripture, and we see it fulfilled in Jesus. But what about crucifix, a crucified or crucifixion? Crucifixion, this is how the Romans killed the, the lowest. It would be a slave or a rebel, like a traitor, would die on a cross. Some of them want to, it's not just you take him out the back and you kill somebody just to get rid of them. You're making a spectacle of their crime and a warning as the punishment by hanging someone up on a, on a tree. Uh, in, some instances, in, in some instances, they'd put them at the front of a city or they'd line a road with people hanging on trees. As a warning, you don't go against Rome. And so for Paul to say, the Christ and him crucified, I put those two things together, for first century, like people in 50 AD, Jews and Gentiles living in Corinth, this would be one of those things where they're like, that's a weird combination of words. How can we have a victorious saviour who died the death of a slave or a rebel? These two things do not go together. The highly exalted one who was ashamed on a tree. To the Gentiles, this was a humiliating death. Again, for the wretched, for the lowly, for the rebellious. A shame and dishonour to the Gentiles and a curse to the Jews. From the Old Testament, cursed is one who dies on a tree. So the Jews loathed the death on the cross. The Gentiles, it was the worst form of not just punishment, but shame to be hanging there in your shame. Not locked away in a cell, not you know, gotten rid of, but made an example of. So Paul here puts these two things together. He associates crucifixion with the anointed one, with the, with the newly inaugurated king, with the beautiful one of heaven. These two things don't, they seem like you know, magnets repelling each other. They don't go together and Paul puts them right together. And he says, this is everything I knew when I was among you. This is all I knew. This is all I preached. This is the only thing I wanted to get across to you. The holy, beautiful, perfect Son of God and him brutally murdered on a tree. Why? He says why, verse 5. So that your faith might not be based on human wisdom, 
but on God's power. We looked at this last week, uh, sorry, week before. We'll look at this again this week. What is this power Paul's talking about? It's through the preaching of Jesus crucified, the Christ, the anointed one, Messiah crucified, that God's wisdom is revealed, leading to genuine faith, resting not in human wisdom, but in the power of God. This is what Paul keeps trying to say. Something I learned early on in, uh, in, in just ministry is what wins people is what's necessary to keep people. So if you are winning people to a very charismatic person, if that charismatic person has a big fall or failure, becomes uncharismatic or moves on, those people will disappear and go to the next nearest charismatic person. If someone is one with eloquent speech and affective preaching, like makes you feel something, then someone who has more affective preaching with different arguments or even preaching a different gospel will be able to sway you or win you away. If someone's one with great music, better music will win those people away. You understand what I'm saying? Um, Paul knows this. He's not trying to win people to himself. This is the very reason, again, he's called for unity as, as the, the foundational element of how a church uh, relates to one another. So you can't say, well, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Peter, I belong to Paul. He says, no, 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 no. We're not winning people to us. We're winning people to Jesus. I want to highlight Jesus. He wants to win people with nothing and to nothing other than Jesus. That's his goal. He's not looking to build his followers. He's not looking to build his platform. not looking to build his audience. not trying to crack into new markets to make himself look big. not kind of trying to increase his power. not trying to increase his prestige. not trying to like, increase his position or get promoted. not trying to do any of those things that we see the sophists in his day and most people in our day doing. He's working to build people up into Christ, into the likeness of Christ, to the glory of Christ. It's his sole goal. So it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that he doesn't use logic. It doesn't mean that he doesn't use you know, rhetorical devices and whatnot. He doesn't trust in those things. He doesn't rest in those things. He's not putting his hope in those things. He's not trying to win people with those things. He understood that the true wisdom of God transcends human understanding and can only be grasped through faith in Jesus. He's not trying to convince somebody into the kingdom when people only enter the kingdom through faith. All he's doing is doing that which leads to faith, which is the proclamation of Jesus and him crucified. Isaiah 55 says, My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, declares Yahweh. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Or, again from last week, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. We're just trying to convince people in with our good arguments, with our... With rationality, I'm not saying that we ditch rationality. So we don't trust in that as primary. It's not going to convince people into the kingdom. Preaching Jesus and him crucified is the power of God. And then the letter. Not many of you were wise according to worldly, worldly standards. Not many were powerful, not many were noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak in the world to shame the strong. Paul has a simple, simple message. So that nothing else gets in the way of the message. He writes elsewhere, the gospel is very offensive already. And I don't want want to add any offense to the gospel. I don't want to put any stumbling block in the way of the gospel. The gospel is already a stumbling block. It can already only be received through faith. So I don't want to put any other stumbling block in the way. Just clarity. Christ and him crucified. The gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. Paul writes to the Romans.
It's the deepest need in every human heart. And so as Paul, Paul acknowledges his weakness, his lack as a preacher, he says, I wasn't a very good preacher among you. We see he's quite eloquent in other places where they try to worship him as a god because of his eloquence. But at the Corinthians, he says, I was not eloquent. I was simple among you. So that the power of God will be at work in and through him. It's a spirit who convicts hearts. It's a spirit that opens minds. It's a spirit that transforms lives through the proclamation of the gospel. It's his chosen vehicle. It's a proclamation of Christ and him crucified. So Paul's aim and our aim isn't to impress people with human wisdom, not to win arguments. We're trying to win people. So having better arguments in, executed poorly can be counterproductive to what we're trying to do. We don't want eloquent speech. We don't want brilliance. But to lead others to a place, to, but to lead others to place their faith in the anointed one of God who died their death. I don't know if you have picked this up. This actually is amazing for us. This takes so much pressure off. But Paul says, I didn't come with eloquence. I didn't come with power. I didn't come with human wisdom. I didn't come with secret knowledge. I came with one thing. Christ had him crucified. Well, actually, he says, I came with fear. I came with trembling. I came with weakness. What does this mean for us? Do you feel weak? If we're given this task to go and be his witnesses in all the earth, to proclaim his lordship, proclaim his love and grace, to declare what he's done, the Holy One of Heaven has come and taken our penalty, redeemed us, defeated sin and death and the deceiver. This is very good news. And we as agents of his good news are tasked just with proclaiming, or primarily I should say, proclaiming this good news. And if you fear proclaiming the news, you're in company with Paul. If you're weak in your proclaiming, you're in company with Paul. If you tremble at the thought of trying to tell somebody about Jesus, you're in good fellowship with Paul. Because he says you don't need eloquence. So if you're waiting for eloquence to go pull the trigger and declare your faith, and I'm not talking about bubble bashing, I'm talking about living a life laid bare so that people can see your sin, your flaws, your failures, your weaknesses, and your hope, and your joy, and your confidence in Jesus, and you're ready to give an answer for the hope that you have within you, because that is not common. And people will ask when you live lives like that. And when we live lives like Jesus commands us in John 13, the, the love we have for one another to be just as he loved us so that everybody looking in will know that we belong to him because of our love. And I want in. That we wouldn't operate out of our fear, wouldn't operate out of our weakness, wouldn't operate out of our trembling, but rather operate in the knowledge that the gospel is the power and the salvation. So if you're waiting to be eloquent, stop waiting. And with, like while you stumble over your words, proclaim Christ and Him crucified. If you're waiting for secret knowledge or to have all the answers, forget about that. Forget about it. Actually, let me, let me recast that. Work on that. But don't wait. Don't let that stop you from proclaiming Christ and Him crucified. Does this make any sense? When you say, I need pers persuasive words, when you say, I need more wisdom, or I need more knowledge, what you're saying is, the gospel depends on me. That's not how it works. And that doesn't work. When we say, the gospel relies on him, on the spirit to move and change hearts. And he does so as people hear Christ and him crucified. It makes our job so easy that we can do that even while we tremble. We can do that while we stumble over our words. We can do that while we are fearful or hesitant. 
Jesus and the power of the gospel. That's what we know. That's what we bring. That's our knowledge. Jesus and the power of the gospel. You're ready. Once you know that, and that, even when that's all you know, you're ready to be used by him. And man, what, what would our lives and our witness and our effectiveness as people who belong to Jesus look like if we stop trusting in ourselves and started just trusting in him? That's what we're working on this week. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you for your scriptures, for your kindness to us in Jesus. Thank you that we don't need eloquence, don't need secret knowledge, don't need worldly wisdom, persuasive words, don't need all the answers to all the questions we're going to be asked. We have your Holy Spirit. We have your gospel. Father, help us, please. Like Paul wrote to Timothy, to not operate with a spirit of timidity or fear, but of boldness, love, self-control. One of power, not our own power, but the power of your spirit working in and through us, the power of your gospel unto salvation. Father, we are so thankful for the many, many people who have responded with faith to the proclamation of the gospel through the people in this community. You've been so good to us. And my request is that that would be a, a, a mark, a banner of this community, that we are not trusting in ourselves, not trusting in our giftedness or our abilities, but trust that you are doing this work in and through us. So Father, help us to encourage one another, help us to, uh, to grow up in, in this, to trust in your spirit more, trust in the gospel more, trust in the name of Jesus more. We pray this in his name and for his sake. Amen.